Let's pray. Lord in heaven, welcome into our hearts. You have invited us into your presence. You have promised to meet us here. And now we open to you. We pray that you will fill us with your spirit. Give us courage, give us consolation. Give us wisdom, give us tact. In this service, in this encounter with you, may we be shaped and molded for service in the week to come. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. The offering for this week is for the Washington Conference Ministries. The funds collected through this offering allow the ministries to expand and reach more people with the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Will the deacons please stand for a short prayer? Father, we thank you for all the opportunity to give, and we pray that these funds will help in bringing more people to you. Amen.
So when I was learning to ride a bicycle, I had a green bicycle, it was about, I think the handlebars were about that tall. I was so excited to get this bicycle. The problem in our neighborhood was there were sidewalks you could ride on, but in a few places there were things sticking out in the sidewalk. And then, I don't know why they did this, there, was a, there were lamp posts on the edge of the sidewalk. That's okay, but by one of these lampposts, I guess because it was near somebody's driveway, they put two big posts, even more on the sidewalk, so you had just a little skinny part of sidewalk that you could go by this lamppost on. And I learned to ride my bicycle, but I wasn't very good yet. I mean, now some of you guys, you're really good, but I was not very good yet. You know, when I'm riding, the handlebars are wiggling, and, and I, you know, I, it was, I wanted to go down the sidewalk, and I wanted to go past that post, that lamp post with those two big posts beside it, but I was worried. Because if I hit those posts, that would not be very good because then I would crash. I would smash my fingers on the post and then the bike would fall over and who knows what I would, maybe there was a rose bush over there. That would not be very good. And so I'm thinking about how I'm going to get by this, these posts. And I had practiced a little bit right in front of my house, but now it was time to see if I could go a little farther and go down past that post and so, Yeah, that would be good, but I couldn't do that. And so I'm going down the sidewalk toward where those posts are out in the sidewalk. And do you know what I did? This is not a very... Before I got to the post, before I got there, but I'm getting close. You know what I did? This is... Oh, it's easy to do this. But one should never do this. This is a recipe for disaster. You know what a recipe for a disaster? A recipe is how you make something... Well, this is how you make bad things happen. When you're riding your bicycle and there's some posts you don't want to run into, you know what I did? I looked at the posts. I stared at the posts because I didn't want to hit them. And I'm watching those posts and they're getting closer and closer and I'm watching the posts. And then you know what I did? I ran into the post. Oh man, it smashed my fingers and then I fell in the rose bush and it was a terrible, horrible, awful thing. Now, where was I supposed to be looking? I was supposed to be looking at the sidewalk that went past the post, right? And if I had been staring at that I, you know, I would have gone right by the post, but instead, those scary posts, they were so scary, I couldn't help myself, and I was staring at them until I ran smack into them. Oh, Oh, this was not good. But I learned after that, that when I got close to the post, and I wanted to look at those posts because they were scary, and I was afraid they were gonna get me, but I learned, no, I stared at that sidewalk, and managed to get by them. Ah, so now, imagine a few years later. Now I'm really good at riding bicycles. You know, I could just ri- I could ride with one hand. I could ride with no hands. Piece of cake. Post didn't even scare me anymore. Now I could ride out in the street because I was good. Now, I don't think this would be true of any of you people. But even when I was young, I had a problem. I was absent-minded. What that means is that when I was riding my bicycle, sometimes I would be thinking about other stuff besides the bicycle. In fact, sometimes I would be thinking so much about other stuff that I didn't pay any attention to where I was going. And especially if there was something interesting to look at over there, You know, I didn't, I would just be looking over there. And so one day I'm riding down the street right near the post, but I wasn't on the sidewalk. The post, no problem. Wide open road. 
I'm riding down the sidewalk, I mean, riding down the middle of the street. It was a beautiful day. I don't know, I was looking at clouds or, I don't know what I was looking at, but I was riding down the road and I was not looking at the road. I wasn't looking at the post. I was looking over there somewhere and all of a sudden, crash! I had run into the back of a car. <laughs> and I, the, I went up onto the back of the car, you know, on the trunk of the car. Now, it was a parked car. There was nobody in it. It probably hurt, but mostly I was embarrassed. And, you know, then I'm looking, did anybody see me do this? I ran into a parked car on my bicycle. How can you do a thing like that? <laughs> With, when I ran into the post, I ran into the post because I went where I was looking. I ran into the back of the car because I did not look where I was going. So the moral of the story, when you're riding your bicycle, pay attention where you're supposed to go. It's better that way. And it'll tie into the sermon somehow. You can get the buckets and collect your offering. of the world, the desire of all nations, and the shepherd of our souls. Let your light shine in the darkness, that all the ends of the earth may see the salvation of our God. By the lifting up of your cross, gather the peoples to your obedience. Let your sheep hear your voice, Lord, and be brought home to your fold, so that there may be one flock, one shepherd, one holy kingdom of righteousness and peace one God 
and Father of all, above all and in all and through all. Grant us that reverence for life, which becomes those who believe in you, lest we despise it, degrade it, or come callously to destroy it. Rather, let us save it, secure it, and sanctify it after the example of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. But there are some Jews, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, whom you have put in charge of the province of Babylon. They pay no attention to you, your majesty. They refuse to serve your gods and do not worship the gold statue you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar flew into a rage and ordered that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought before him. When they were brought in, Nebuchadnezzar said to them, is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you refuse to serve my gods or to worship the gold statue I have set up? I will give you one more chance to bow down and worship the statue I have made when you hear the sound of the musical instruments. But if you refuse, you will be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace. And then what god will be able to rescue you from my power? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. But even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue you have set up.
Then the devil took him up and revealed him to all of the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. I will give you the glory of these kingdoms and the authority over them, the devil said, because they are mine to give to anyone I please. I will give it all to you if you will worship me. Jesus replied, the scriptures say, you must worship the Lord, your God, and serve only him. So first, a retraction from last week. There's actually a significant theological message in this retraction. I gave you a lecture on physics last week. Now, you folks know that as a preacher, I know everything and I'm the last word. (laughs) One of the engineers in church had the audacity to point out that I had the physics wrong. Now, I was correct that the direction of angular momentum is the direction your thumb is pointing if your fingers are pointed the direction the wheel turns. But after that, I went into the mud. So if you want to know how the physics of angular momentum relates to riding a bicycle, the physicist said it actually doesn't, um, talk to a physicist. As a preacher, the nice thing about being a preacher is you can recycle anything. You can use everything. You know, crashing into poles, landing in rose bushes, you can turn it into a sermon. I mean, it's wonderful. But please, and now I'm going to meddling and I'm making a strong statement. Let's not regard the pulpit as the last word in science including geology. We'll screw that up every bit as well as I did the physics last week. All right, we're done with that. Now let's go to what I know about, I think. (laughs) What does it mean to worship? Yeah, there's books written on it. But I'm going to work with a simple picture. Worship means to to give attention and admiration, respect. These two elements, attention, focus, accompanied by some attitudes of of awe, respect, deference, something like that. That's what it means to worship. To steal from the children's story. If we want our moral lives to avoid landing on the back of parked cars, worship is the practice of looking again in the direction that we need to go, the direction we want to go. And we come to church. The heart of what we do in church is worship. It is paying attention to and honoring the grand ideal of God and goodness. And we come to church, there's all kinds of benefits You know, you can measure it. If you go to church, you live better. I mean, in terms of you're happier and you're healthier in general. So we come to church. We have a good time in fellowship. That's, That's valuable. We come to church. We have grand music. We come to church and maybe the preacher says something interesting. Those are all part of church life. But they're organized around, they're clustered around our commitment to this grand ideal of God and goodness. If all we were after was music, 
buy a CD or go to the symphony. If all we were after was fellowship, go to a bar. If all we were after was interesting words, read a book. We do those things, and those are part of the experience of church. But they're clustered around this vision of God and goodness. So, you heard the scripture reading. Jesus is out in the desert, and the devil comes and says, I got an offer you can't refuse. The devil had made another offer a little bit before, and Jesus had refused that. The devil's getting desperate. You know, he really wants to close this deal. He says, look, I'll give you everything I've got. All that I've got, the entire world, all the kingdoms, all the authority and power, yeah, you can have it all. I just ask this. Give me a little obeisance. Acknowledge I gave it to you. Deal? Think what you could do with that much power. Think how much good you could do with that much power. Jesus' disciples, except for John, they were all martyred. If Jesus had taken the devil, devil's deal, Jesus could have kept him alive. The devil offered him power. One little price, but he offered him power. And Jesus turned it down. Why did he turn it down? Now, if you read commentaries on, on this temptation, you know, we... We go all kinds of directions in the commentaries. One of the questions naturally would be, hey, the devil's offering this, but it, it, does he really have it to give? You know, it's like if I offer you a million bucks, you're going, yeah, right. Did the devil have this to give? Now, people will look at that. Second question is, yeah, would you do business with the devil even if he had it? I mean, so he promises you all this stuff, and he's actually got it. He shows it to you. I got it right here. Shh. You do what he asks. Is he going to pay up? You know, people go there. Interesting questions, but they, they do not appear in the text. Jesus does not ask those questions. In this story, Jesus treats this as a straight-up bona fide offer. And he goes straight to the price. says, I won't pay there's one price I will not pay. You've asked for worship, but I've already decided where worship belongs. I will worship God and God only. And it doesn't matter what you're offering me. You could offer me holiness and righteousness. And if the cost was to divert my worship from God, I wouldn't take it. In this story, Jesus uses worship, authentic, genuine worship, as the antidote to the most powerful temptation I think any man has ever experienced. I mean, just imagine what you could do with that much power. You know, I laugh at my friends on Facebook who argue back and forth politically. And of course, if you're on the right or on the left, the other people are idiots and evil. And if we could just do it my way, everything would be fine. The devil was saying, okay, you can do it your way. Organize the world the way you want it. I'll give you complete power. And Jesus won't take it. Because he was asked to divert his worship. One of the reasons, I would argue, the most important reason for being part of church is because in church, we come and we worship. We turn our attention to the highest ideals 
the highest dreams humanity is capable of. You know, the Bible prophets paint this vision of what God wants. And in church, we come and we pay attention to that. This past week highlights the need to do that. Okay, so you think of the horror that happened in France. But if it wasn't this week and it wasn't France, imagine a week in this country when there was a school shooting. Imagine a week when it's not people misbehaving, but it's nature misbehaving. And imagine a tsunami that kills hundreds of thousands. We live in a world where awful stuff is real and it does happen. And it is very easy for our attention to be owned by the awful stuff. We as Adventists and a lot of conservative Christians have had a special temptation there because we link it to the last days. And then we relish every bit of bad news. Tell me some more bad news because that means we're getting closer. More bad news until eventually our attention is owned by the bad news. that happens either we're not worshiping or our worship has has been corrupted because in worship we are to give attention devoted reverential admiring attention to the grand ideals of God and goodness here in this place in this hour we insist to ourselves and sometimes we have to you know kind of pound on our heads to push into our minds this conviction that beauty and goodness, generosity and integrity, honesty, loyalty, kindness, that these are real and that they are the very highest virtues. They are higher than all this stuff. And when we are tempted to imagine that the remedy for the world's problems is retribution, more violence, anger, we come to church and we go, no, no, no. Yeah, we we feel the allure of that, but here we go, no. The answer is to exalt again the ideal. A God who is so generous and so good, he would rather die than live without us, and not just us but the ugly people and the awful people as well, which might be us on occasion. (laughs) That's what worship is. And so we come to church and we worship. You know, if you gave us quizzes, if you, you interrogated us, we have all kinds of different ideas, different details of theology or non-theology. We've got all that stuff and that's, that's okay. It's the nature of human reality. If you got a group of people together who only thought the same thing, they're lying. They've been maybe scared into saying it. Brains don't work that way. But we do come here and we say above all of that is that grand vision, that goodness and generosity and kindness and mercy. That's God. And that is the pole star of our life individually and corporately. And when we see that clearly, we can dodge the other stuff. In 1968, I was in 10th grade at Memphis Junior Academy. In February, two sanitation workers were crushed in the compactor of a garbage truck. It was an accident. Nobody intended it. But if you looked at work conditions, it was an accident waiting to happen. You could almost say it was an accident begging to happen. Well, it happened. Two men, dads, husbands, crushed. Ten days later, sanitation workers in Memphis went on strike. 90% of them 
didn't show up for work on Monday morning. The mayor got upset. Mayor Loeb, I still remember Mayor Loeb. He was upset. This is an illegal thing. You people get back to work like you're supposed to. And don't you think I will bend an inch? Sanitation workers in Memphis, those who actually picked up the garbage, not those who drove the truck, 100% black. Power structure in Memphis was 100% white. But since the garbage collectors were black, we figured they were supposed to be grateful for whatever we paid them. And the lack of benefits and the dangerous conditions, I won't go into the gory details, it was pretty miserable. Ingrates, asking for better, con asking to be treated like human beings, what's up with that? Well, the strike went on, the workers hung together, Eventually got national attention. Martin Luther King Jr. came into town in March. He came again at the end of March, 1st of April. And in school, I remember the buzz. It was a whites-only school. I think that's the only kind of schools there were, except for black-only schools. And the conversation among all the students was about the rumors running through the city that Martin Luther King, somebody was going to take care of him, and they meant assassination. April 3, Wednesday night, Dr. King spoke at the Charles Mason Temple. He talked about the story of the Good Samaritan, and he asked the question, because, of course, you know, the thousands of people, these are not just sanitation workers, it's a lot of people. And he's saying, if we don't come and stand with these folks, if we do not respond to them in their hour of need, who will? And what does that make us? And then he closed his speech there that Wednesday night with these words. Well, I don't know what will happen now. We've got some difficult days ahead, but it doesn't really matter to me now because I have been to the mountaintop. A little later he continued, like anybody, I would like to live. Long life, longevity, it has its place. But I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain and I've looked over and I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you. But I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. So I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not afraid of any man. And then this line. Mine eyes have seen the glory the coming of the Lord. He had worshipped. His eyes were full of that divine vision. Now let's be clear. The courage that he's speaking there is a special kind of courage. If you imagine that a parent, a mom or a dad, rushing back into a burning house to grab their child, I think most of us would do that. It's heroic. But you can almost imagine in the moment, the adrenaline, you've got to do something now, and, and you do it. You think of a soldier in a split second making a throwing himself on a hand grenade to save his friends. I do not mean to make light of that kind of courage, but the courage that Dr. King was showing in this case there in Memphis was something different. His life had been under threat for years, and he could have stayed away. Memphis was not his town. In fact, when he first got involved down in uh, Montgomery, he had a comfortable pastorate. And he could have kept it comfortable. 
you know, preach the gospel, taking care of people. He could have kept his nose clean and enjoyed life. But he was too full of the heavenly vision articulated by the prophets, especially the Old Testament. And for the next 13 years, he had been pushing and pushing and pushing, pushing with two things, two elements of this pushing, pushing for justice and resisting the constant allure of violence. I don't know about you, but when somebody smacks me, I tend to want to smack back. (laughs) And if somebody smacks somebody that is mine, I really want to smack back. Dr. King resisted. He resisted the allure of that kind of power. How? How did he have the courage to just stubbornly, deliberately, without the adrenaline of right now, right here? How did he keep that vision alive? He worshiped. He he kept coming back to the heavenly vision of God and goodness and mercy and justice. And he could not be owned by the lesser things. Because of that vision. He was killed the next day. The rumors were not just crazy stories. But if your daddy was Dr. King, and you tell the story of his death, you would not tell it as a tragedy. You would tell it as a triumph. Those who shot him did not win. They lost. Evil will always lose ultimately. And that's what we affirm in worship. Goodness is going to win. God is going to win. And we come here to remind ourselves even on the days when it seems like a fairy tale, it is still the truth. So we come together in worship. We come together again and again and again to look as as keenly as possible into the glorious ideal of God. And we pray that God will take that vision and pour it through our eyes and live it out through our hands and our feet. That's what Jesus was setting up when he refused to bow to anything less than God. We are his people. Let us have the same commitment.
Let's pray. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen.